Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for being here uh, on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, really great. But I'm not going to say good morning to you, especially to those of you that have come in to Munich, but rather servus. So welcome in the custom Bavarian greeting. Very nice to have you all here. Now, can I just have a show of hands? How many have come in? How many are not from Munich? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Goodness. Okay, then good. Then I hope that my my talk is targeted well. So it's great that you're here. Had this conference been this time last week, you would absolutely not have a hotel room <laughs> because last week was the biggest party in the world uh, with Oktoberfest. And as I was looking through the news, I decided that it was the largest one ever held at 7.2 million people. Now when you think that Munich has a population of, I always forget the numbers, about 1.6 depending if you count the suburbs, you're definitely not cracking 2 million, but 702 million people descended upon Munich to in one little space of the Theresian visa to come together and to celebrate to celebrate as a global community and to have a good time. So, if you didn't have a chance to go to Oktoberfest, that's okay, you can still have this feeling of Bavaria, the culture of Bavaria, what we call Bavarian Gemütlichkeit, coziness, and you can have that because Bavaria also has these, beer gardens. Now, beer gardens are a unique tradition that are a good 200 years old. They started with a law, they were reinforced with a law in 1999, but the idea is the following, that several 200 years ago or so, the brewers along the river Isar were wanted to produce their bottom fermenting beers. Okay, The merits of beers, those were developed in the springtime, they needed a place to cool them, so they wanted to put them in the cellars. Now, because of the high water table in Munich, they couldn't go very deep down, so they had to stay rather shallow. Well, that caused a little bit of a problem, right? So this is what uh, the storage looked like, and if you go into the halls now, into the breweries, you can go down there, a lot of places you can actually eat down in the cellar areas. The idea was that they needed to keep it cool, but being so close to the ground, it was a little bit challenging. So what they did is they put covered it all in gravel. So the gravel acted as insulation, reflected the light up, and they planted a lot of chestnut trees. So chestnut trees are big and broad, cover big areas, but they also have very shallow roots. And so with that, they ended up creating this incredible place, right? With the gravel there, with the chestnut trees, and really nothing else. So they put in a bunch of tables. And now the restaurant started to complain because the breweries were serving beer and serving food, and the restaurant owner said, no, 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 that's unfair competition. And so there was actually a law that said, you can have your beer garden, but you can't serve food. And that really started part of this beer garden culture, where you go and you bring your food. Now there's many places that you eat food now that you can't do that, but there's a lot of Bavarian beer gardens where you can still bring your food and you buy your beer from the brewery. So this has kind of brought together this really interesting culture in Munich and in Bavaria, and frequently the beer gardens have been called Munich's summer living rooms because families would come together, they would put out their red and white checkered blanket or uh, uh, tablecloths, they would have their food, they would buy their beer, they would send out, spend the entire afternoon out there, the kids would run around and play, people would meet each other, and it actually kind of developed this culture, this etiquette. And so if you manage to go to one of the beer gardens, there's a few things to know. You'll notice the chestnut trees, the gravel. There's no table for two in beer gardens. They're all the same. And the idea is that if you are with a group of four, and there's four more seats available, people can sit down and you welcome them. Sure, absolutely, grab a seat, please. You sit down and you introduce with first names. You say, hi, I'm Laura, nice to meet you, go ahead and grab a seat. When you toast, when you drink with your beer moss, you toast, now the rule, apparently there's a rule that you're supposed to, to post around the table 10 times per moss. I've never managed to do that in my entire life. But the idea is that you toast each other around the table. So the strangers that are on the other side, when you're ready to sip, you toast each other, you look them in the eye, you have that moment of human connection with them. 
and you, you clink glasses, and you post, and you drink, and then of course, you can bring whatever you like to the beer garden. Now, why am I saying all of this? One, because I want you to have a great time here in Munich while you're here, but one, this kind of developed over about a 200-year span or so. Also, what was kind of happening at that time relates more directly to us. Physics, academics, really hit a stride here in Munich. And the same people who were out in the beer gardens would be returning in to go in to their lectures. So here in Munich, we have two universities of excellence, the Technical University of Munich, the LMU. This one is from a physics uh, auditorium being built somewhere in the 1920s. A uh, typical scene filling up one of the Herzals, one of the lecture halls in LMU. The tradition of Munich and physics is prolific. And for many of those, many of you, I don't need to tell you, but for those of you that may be a little less frequently or familiar, Munich really has giants in the field, has the long history. And these were just a couple of names that I pulled up that everybody in this room, I would assume, would know. But the amount of Nobel laureates, caps over 20 in our region, um, prolific minds have come together in this hot spot of innovation, of thought together, and have made amazing and big contributions. Today, that continues on. Munich is still a hot spot of innovation with places, and you may have heard, um, we, there was another Nobel Prize awarded uh, right in the Garching Research Campus. We have the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics that has been leaders in our field for a very long time. We have institutions like the Walter Meisner Institute for low and ultra low temperature physics who have created and pushed forward the boundaries of technology for cryogenic, um, for cryogenic systems literally at the forefront, and we have continued to, we have been there from the beginning, and we continue to be there. So this is not bolstering, this is not, not bragging. Uh, my grandmother always said it's not bragging if it's true. So <laughs> this is true. Now, this brings me to the Munich Quantum Valley. This is an initiative that was started by the Bavarian government from this high-tech agenda of Bavaria, a very aggressive, really unique to Germany, pouring hundreds of millions of euros into this environment with the purpose to develop and operate and be competitive and on a world stage quantum systems within Bavaria. This includes superconducting systems, ion systems, neutral atoms, and with the operating and being competitive, there's also a large component to the software stack, right? Between the user and the hardware is the software, the big important part. And so that's what we're going to talk a bit more about today. Now, the Munich Quantum Valley is very well funded, a whole lot of people involved. And what is really, really great, kind of like I hope this room today, it's very diversified. It's very heterogeneous. Building quantum systems, putting together the software, putting it out into the environment, spinning off companies, getting tech transfer out, getting these things competitive and viable, this takes an awful lot of effort. And it takes an awful lot of people. And not only, as great as you are, theoretical physicist, or as great as you are, experimental physicist, but it, it takes a whole community. It takes computer scientists, facilities specialists, electrical engineers, software developers, software engineers, HPC engineers, you name it. And that's what's really, what's exciting about this space and what we see is that we have this mixture of incredible people coming from different perspectives, bringing their thoughts to the table, coming all together, sitting down, clinking glasses, clinking minds, and working this out. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this today. Now, I want to add uh, LRZ into this mix. So that's where I'm from, and that's where I'm representing today. The Leibniz Supercomputing Center, we have been around for about 60 years. 
and we are uh, just over there, I think, that way. <laughs> that way, thank you, Marco, that way, okay. <laughs> We're just over that way. And um, you can see that we are made of one big compute cube that's in the lower left over there, and then offices, office buildings going down the bottom of the picture. We have about 300 team members with us, and we are responsible for providing the compute capabilities to the universities, to TUM, to LMU, but also to other Bavarian entities, um, the state, uh, the state sorry, library. Um, we do data storage, we do several different things. We really try to be an all-stop shop for computing needs for these universities. Now, at a national level, we are one of three supercomputing centers that Germany has, along with Jülich and Stuttgart. And so we are what's called a tier one center, and we provide German academic users with access to our supercomputing resources. And then going even higher, we are a member of the European supercomputing realm, which means as a host member state, we provide access to European users, again, in the same realm. So we have an awful lot going on. Now this is a quantum talk, but I'm an HPC person, and no talk that I will ever give will not have uh, our, our current flagship system. This is SuperMOC NG, and actually we have a phase two of this that will be coming in soon. We're already working on the procurement for the system after that one, but this one has been a fantastic workhorse for us. It's been around a bit, so it's kind of getting up there in years. Uh, um, in HPC years are a little less, actually a little bit more unkind than dog years. So <laughs> this is um, this will be this will be taking its last its last laps um, before too terribly long. But this is a really great system that has worked for us and has really brought us forward and our users forward in the work and in the science that they have been able to gain with it. So as I kind of mentioned before, not only as great as supercomputing is, we do networking, we basically do the entire Munich uh, network, large data storage, uh, virtual reality, and then again, email servers, network, storage, cloud cluster, all of that stuff we take care of. In addition to that, which makes us even a bit, which makes us different from a typical data center, is that we have training and education because stocked in our halls at LRZ are many, many people who are domain specialists with PhDs of their own in different domain spaces who then come to the supercomputing center to act as a bridge between the research community and the resources that we have. They understand the systems intimately, how to use them, how to squeeze best performance out of them, and then they work with the academic community to help them optimize their codes and how to optimize their science. This has been the pattern for us for HPC for decades, and now this is the pattern for us in quantum as well. It's kind of hard to just buy a system, and that's frequently what we do not do. Um, these systems are bespoke in every case, from HPC to AI to quantum. And so with that, we don't get something that you can just roll in, plug into the wall, and go. Doesn't work that way. We get the systems, we work with the vendors to tell them what issues our users have, because we work with them so closely that we know that. We talk to them, we work with them to build capabilities that the vendor builds, that we build, that we build with the user. And so capability development, this applied R&D, is a really important component that makes all of this go. And in the last couple of years, um, when Dieter Kronzenbüller, our director from LRZ, uh, took his position, one of the first things he did was establish a future computing group. And with this, we pushed even forward into the future, not what our users need now or in the near term, but what they need later on what they're going to need in the mid and long term. So we do very aggressive tech scouting in next generation AI, in next generation HPC systems, and then really that's what brought us to quantum. So as an HPC center, I mean, we've got, we're pretty busy. We got a whole lot going on. So why are we thinking about quantum? Pretty far out there, right? But for us, from an HPC perspective, 
We see quantum as an accelerator to HPC systems. We see the ability for quantum, for the type of behavior of quantum calculation behavior, to solve particular types of problems or parts of problems that have been less efficient or intractable for us so far. So we look at it from, there are all of these problems out there that we can get so far every time we get a new generation of HPC compute, we can get a little bit closer, we can study a little bit more. With AI, we have a different type of compute and machine learning that we can attack problems in a different way. And now we've got quantum coming into this as an accelerator capability, and we're looking at this as another way that maybe we can crack some of these interesting problems. Or with that, define new questions, or define new problems. So for us, it's a new compute capability that adds to this already advanced, ever maturing, existing uh, portfolio, and it allows the ability to potentially change some things or to solve some things that we haven't been able to so far. So this makes it very, very exciting for us. Now, as an HPC center, we have a couple of roles in this, in this game. So, as you know, HPC systems, while they still need capability development and all, they are pretty robust systems, they have their certifications, these things get mass produced, right? They have a certain level of maturity that quantum systems at this time do not. Quantum systems are coming out of the physics labs, they're coming out of early startups. They need to come into an environment, they're currently in an environment where they're somewhat padded, where they have a physicist hanging around them, maybe 24-7, depending on the severity of the advisors, right? And so they're taken care of by experts that are perfectly tuned to, to, to work with them. When you bring them into an HPC type of environment, these systems, we require more out of them. We require them to be more robust, we, we require them to not have to be touched as much and worked with. They end up going into a data center environment where there is limited access, right? Where we kind of, we, we're not dark center, but we are definitely less accessible. And so these systems kind of have to go through a maturation process, and that's fine. We also have environmental factors with those systems. Um, that, that could end up causing problems, that could anger the qubits and cause problems with the electromagnetic uh, of the systems around them, with the temperature variance, all of these different factors. So as we're moving to next generation quantum systems, we want to be able to study them now and say, give recommendations to say, look, this works okay, this works okay, you really need to do extra shielding here, you need to turn the vents 90 degrees so they actually fit in the row of the 19-inch racks. All these different components. That's one job that we have for quantum enabled. Uh, excuse me, for quantum HPC enablement. We are developing a software stack, and I'll get to that in a little, in a few more minutes in more depth. And then we are user focused. Again, at the end of the day, we are a user facility. We stand up all of this for the users. So as cool as this technology is, if we get to the point that nobody's using it, nobody wants to use it, or nobody can use it, it kind of defeats the purpose of why it's there, right? So we're gonna actually start with the user-focused part of this because that really is the bread and butter of why we're doing what we're doing. As a center like ours, we're an academic center. Um, and so we have a very, very broad user base. As I said, we did all these things for the users, but they come from all these different domain spaces. Right? We've got the astro for the HPC space, we've got the astrophysicists that we really love because regardless of how much compute we give them, they can always use more and they always want more, right? Because right now we're able to interpret just a slice of the universe, give them a whole bunch more compute beyond our current capabilities, and they'll be able to compute like another small slice, right? So they're cool to work with because they always want more. But as we go, as we go down the scaling needs, we have a lot of people that want to use parallel computing, that want to use advanced computing in new ways, new communities, the machine learning, AI communities with big data models, those are really starting to hit their stride, right? When we have, and then we have all the way into the sociologist, 
who want to be able to use advanced computing in some interesting ways, but behavior-wise, they haven't really dealt with it before, and so we want to provide those sort of capabilities for them, but we have to, we have to package it, we have to develop capabilities for them that are a bit different from what we call the bare metals, you know, like the ones who don't want our operating systems, they want to code an assembly, and they just want us to get out of their way, right? So we have these different domains, we have different cultures, we have different capabilities, we have different workflows. Um, in, in the quantum space, we use a lot of Python, in HPC we don't use a lot of Python. We have several different things that make bringing everybody together an interesting challenge. Now, um, I come from the Department of Energy where we had, you, we bought systems for a handful of codes. And it was only like those codes. Those codes were a million plus lines long. They were optimized for that architecture. We procured new systems for those codes, right? So it was really targeted, really specific. Here, we have to stay necessarily broad, at the same time attempting to figure out how to raise the innovation level of these user groups. Oh, and I should mention that um, on the QCT team uh, at uh, um, LRZ, Hi, which I think Hi is here. Yes, Hi is there. So if you're interested about user groups, um, please go talk to him, because one of the big things that he's working on right now is to take the idea, the groupings and all that we use, from the HPC space, these users, from the AI space, these users, and determine what our quantum user landscape looks like. But not just the quantum user landscape, but the HPC landscape, and then that middle zone. What, what, what are the users working to use hybrid going to do? What do they want to do? What do they think they want to do? What are they really doing? What do they want to do? What are they developing? How are they approaching it? All of these questions are happening um, as we're moving in real time with the development of the actual technology. So I have quite a job in front of him. Okay, but again, all of this technology is developing. At the same time, we need to be providing the users for it so the users can figure out what's useful and what isn't. So we have to still provide access. And so we do that with something that we call the Bavarian Quantum Portal. So this is the first, <coughs> excuse me, this is the first uh, portal or the software package I want to describe to you. This basically looks like this. The idea is fairly simple. This is straight uh, user to quantum access. This uh, hooks in with our LRZ um, ID systems. This does budget reporting, allocation reporting, job overviews, it's working on developing as we go on, code editing, circuit building assistance. For administrators, it allows us to have allocation tokens, um, budget management, all of that sort of stuff. It's fairly simple. You can create a token. The token can be very loaded with security parameters, all this sort of stuff on the back end that we need. You take your token, you use it. You can, um, you can also connect it now to things like Qiskit, um, and so you can fire a shot directly utilizing the Qiskit version, excuse me, using Qiskit, um, putting in your token, running that through, and contacting our system. I'll get to our system in just a few minutes, but that's basically where we're at right now. So this is going really well and is one of our um, available softwares that we're gonna be releasing for our users here not too long. Uh, quantum HPC enablement. So, going back to the Munich Quantum Valley story, we have this big job, and there's a lot of people involved in this. We are wanting to ensure that we develop a comprehensive, flexible, extendable, full stack, open source, all the bells and whistles that we possibly can for our users. A software stack that will allow for computing on these systems in Bavaria, and then also, importantly, very importantly, allow for the HPC QC um, hybridization of these, of these workloads onto both systems in an efficient manner. We do this by working with consortia within the MQV, 
by working with related consortia, related projects, all the way up, again, from the regional, the German, and the European level. This is the team, um, fairly big, uh, eight research groups over three organizations. The LRZ shows up twice because Dieter Kanzenmüller is split in half between LMU and LRZ, and then Martin Schultz on the other side is split in half between LRZ and TUM. That's why you get that kind of uh, wraparound effect. But this is our team. And again, these are computer scientists, these are software designers, these are process designers, um, physicists. It's this mixture of folks that will allow us to really attack this software stick with some vigor. Now, one of the folks in the room, Amr, I, I saw him here earlier. Where did Amr go? Hey, Amr. Okay, so one work that Amr did um, is when we're talking about hi um, hybridizing workflows, what does that actually mean? And we have different types of integration. We have loose integration. We have loose integration where it's standalone, where from your laptop, you call a quantum system over uh, HTTPS, and you send the shot that way. That's very loose, standalone. That's where we're at for a lot of systems right now. We also have loose integrated where it's co-located, and that gets a little bit more fancy. You're running through an HPC system, but it's still uh, an iterative step forward. As we start getting tighter, which is what LRZ is very interested in, we want to get as tight as possible because we want to reduce latency, we want to maximize the capabilities inherent to both of those systems working together. And notwithstanding, energy for us is very expensive. When you have systems idling, every time those systems are idling, it costs money. And from pure mechanics, energy in Europe is crazy compared to I come from the US. Sorry, not being flippant, but you know, you can just flip on another switch at the nuclear power plant and then things get better. You know, here, it's very, very expensive, and we want to be able to maximize, and we want to be efficient. More science, or more compute is more science, and dead time, energy-wise, is not a good thing. So we want to co-locate. We want to be able to access, eventually, multiple CPUs via an HPC uh, interface into the system, working more tightly. As we get even more tightly, so this is really kind of in the future a bit, as we get really, really tight, we're gonna we will hope to go on node, where ideally, from the pulse from the HPC chip, we're calling the pulses from the, from the nodes, and we're, we're killing off a lot of the middleman devices in between in order to speed things up and to be effective. So, this is complicated, I will not go through this, um, this is our Munich quantum software stack. So this is the result of a lot of thinking and a lot of masterminding from um, Martin Rufinacht, who is on our team. Um, he is our architect uh, at LRZ, working very closely with the head of the um, consortia for the software stack, Martin Schultz. And the idea is that I just covered the Munich, or the Bavarian quantum portal, so I'll skip that right now. But now I want to talk a little bit about HPC access and what goes into that. And that's down here in this corner. I'm going to give you a kind of an overview. I cleaned up this chart here to give you a little bit of an overview. But basically, you're going to go through an HPC login node. We're going to use a Slurm scheduler, very, very common place. We go through that. Um, the code is ready to be prepped to be sent off, offloaded off to the QPU. Now, just like in HPC land, and this is all going to stay the same, MPI is going to work on coordination uh, within the HPC environment. Typically, when you want to offload to a GPU, you may use CUDA. You probably know that. However, when you want to offload to a QPU, we don't currently have that uh, in a solid state. And so we're working on a QPI environment that allows you to offload to that HPC node, what we have tried to do is to make it similar for the quantum user in that you can use your Qiskit environment, but you have, but you have to wrap it within an HPC space. <coughs> for the HPC users, you're going to recognize that because it's going to have the same sort of offload behaviors and characteristics, but you're dealing with kind of the circuit design. As we move forward, we want, for at least for the HPC users, we want to be able to streamline that, remove kind of the circuit, the quantum circuit approach for this, and take it more towards direct to HPC code. 
So this is work that is being conducted by two of our teammates, Barack and Etchemet. And so if you're interested in this, please ping them, and they would love to talk to you about this at length. Now, once you have the QPU, you're ready to move over, Quantum Demon, you go into the back end. This is the big back end pipeline. This is work done by Jorge and Newfail on our team, on our team, but there's a lot of work done on this uh, within our Munich software stack as well. So in that, we have to worry about daemons, which act as bridges, which act as schedulers. We have a resource manager. We have scheduling components. And all of these go to these back-end systems. So I have a whole bunch of them listed here. Superconductor, I'll go through these in just a moment. Again, remember Munich Quantum Valley, those three systems up top. We've got future quantum systems that we're tech scouting. We're looking at remote access. And then we've got ones for our projects as well. So we're really building up a, a quantum farm. This is some of the work from, I think, Newfail, if I remember correctly, basically what those components look like. With the resource manager, you've got several different components involved here, from the scheduler, um, transpiler, optimizer, circuit cutter, et cetera, running to the quantum server. And then you hit this interface called the QDMI, which is the, oh, there's so many Q words here, quantum device management interface? Thanks, OK. Yeah, they keep, every, like every time I read the Q logs at work, they're, they're coming up with new Q names. Um, so the QDMI basically acts as the unique coupler between our back end of our compiler hooking in to the actual quantum systems uniquely. Everybody handles because of the pulse control, the lasers, whatever you have it. They all handle the, um, the timing, the scheduling, all that a little bit differently, and so the QDMI is going to account for that based on the individual technology. Okay, and so I'm wrapping up here. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail in the chunk of this area because I know uh, Lucas yep, is going to be giving a talk later on, and he's going to deep dive into this space, so I'm going to kind of leave this space open a bit and uh, let him fill in more details for you there. Okay, now, hardening. So, this is our quantum integration center. This is not our compute cube. This is a separate space in, our, in one of our basements that we opened up because we have a lot of technology that's new that we have to go to a lot um, that we want to be able to get access to quickly. We want to be able to turn a lot of dials, figure a lot of things out. And so we have this separate space that I kind of call as like a, an incubator or a kind of a safe house between the physics labs or the startups and the compute cube, which is a real production environment. So this is our quantum integration center. We have a cold lab, which is currently finishing our construction, which is great. That'll seat at least uh, four cryostats. And we have a warm lab that will seat our non-cryogenic systems. There's a cryogenic system in now just because of construction delays. But the idea is that using the quick and the compute cube, we're building a pipeline of maturation and maturity. Now, this is our current roadmap for our superconducting systems. We go right now from um, a modest five qubit system for R&D purposes in our compute and our quick. We're upgrading that to a 20. We have another 20 from the QXA coming in that's actually already in the compute cube. We'll be going online later this year, or later, beginning of next year. And then we've got two other systems, at, at least at 50 and at least at 100, that'll be coming in in the coming years. Those are all being coupled with the compute systems. Um, and this is also a progression of the series systems coming in. So as we continue to develop this, this integration software, we keep pushing it out to the various new systems coming in and getting better and better at what we do. That's the superconducting. We, um, that's the superconducting line I mentioned. Again, because the MQV, we have an ion trap line that's being developed, a neutral atom line that's being developed, and those are all being connected to our test bed for early experimentation. Once we get uh, a level of security and trust, we move it over into the more production environment. Okay. This is the one system that is currently standing, the QXA. Um, this one is this here, right now. Now, it was kind of interesting bringing that in because this represented 
some issues that we had when we put the first system in, the five qubit one, in the quick. And then we had some new problems. In a compute environment, we had false floors. We had to figure out how to deal with the vibration. We sorted that out. Gas handling and refilling is kind of a bummer for a compute <laughs> cube environment. We don't typically have to deal with that. Going and changing out the liquid nitrogen every week or every other week, that's kind of a bummer. Um, compressor locations, pipe physics for that. All of this was stuff that we had to figure out. We had to figure out what sort of influence the HPC system might have on the compute on the quantum system, and what sort is there a potential effect that the quantum system has on the HPC? I don't know. That's what we're figuring out. But this diagram here, to the right is the space that we have. The top part is for QEXA. The bottom part is for two other systems that will be coming in. And this is part of the Euro HPC joint undertaking. LRZ was selected as one of the sites to host the systems. This is going to be the 5000 qubit line um, that will be hosted at LRZ and will be made available for the users. Now, Euro HPC, I really like that they did this because I really like missions and I like challenges, but they basically said, you can put a quantum computer, we'll give you a quantum computer, you have to put it in your data center, you have to make it available to the users, you have to make it partially available to industry users, and you have to access it only through the HPC system. Right? So they really put down the gauntlet of what we need to do, which, again, I like the challenge, so I'm happy that they did this, but it causes some problems because we also had to sign an SLA for promising to keep the system going at a certain percentage, the uptime, um, the maintenance, the user interactions. So this really puts us into a mode of practicing with our other systems to make sure that we're ready to go. And this brings me to some work that Hossam did. I don't know if Hossam is here. No, not yet. Okay, so um, Hossam on our team has been working on telemetry software, another software package. And the idea is, when we talked to these vendors early on, we said, hey, our, our environment here has this temperature range. Are you okay with that? And they said, well, we need a temperature range like this. And we said, well, we have a temperature range like this. Is, do we need this? Is this important? And they're like, we don't know. And so we're like, okay, well, <laughs> this could cause problems. So the one thing that we did is that we just IOT'd the heck out of the Quantum Integration Center. We put in many, many different parameters. Uh, sorry, this is Hossam's drawing. Um, we basically took QPU data, environmental data, data from the cryostat, anything that we could find. We put sensors on the elevators, down the hall, all sorts of things to be able to pull all the data together <coughs> to figure out if there would be any sort of event, any sort of problem that we could track for predictive calibration as we move forward or in general for just general operations. So this is a, pro a thing that he's been working on. Now the idea, now we're going to be slick, the idea is that we want to be able to tell if the, if the decoherence is happening faster than the predicted, than the scheduled calibration, the scheduled maintenance that we have as part of the SLAs. If we have some sort of issue, we want to be able to route that in to our resource manager. We want to be able to move our users over to other systems in order to keep the operation going, or we want to be able to notify the users far enough ahead of time that it doesn't become a spontaneous outage. Right? So we're trying to we're trying to put this in with the quantum or with the Bavarian quantum portal to bring all this together to have an understanding as a as a um, dynamic system back and forth within the data center, how these uh, quantum systems are operating, and then how it affects the actual users using the systems. Okay, and so let's go through this quickly. He has QPU data, determining the rate. These are some of the environmental parameters. We keep adding on to these as we discover more potential. And then we're, we're funneling all of that into the data center database of LRZ. This is something that we have developed because of our um, HPC system. Our HPC system is also completely tuned and censored, um, and thousands of censored 
Not only that, the building itself is censored. So all of this is already set up for the HPC side of the house. Now we're going to be setting up the quantum components, bringing it into that environment, and then trying to analyze and understand all of this as a whole. Okay, so we've got those three directions. As I've kind of gone through all of this, it affects the infrastructure, the hardware, the software, the applications, the culture, many different components here. But basically, the end goal here is that we want to move away from a standalone quantum system with its own monitoring. We want it to be part of the whole of the entire data center. We want quantum systems to not be standalone appliances with the cryostat, the control, and all that, and then their own compute fenced. We want it to be integrated. We want workload and work carried over to the HPC system and middleman devices and components reduced down. We don't want to have two separate software stacks. We want to have an integrated software stack that are working together. We want to have better algorithms that, that more attune and more address and capitalize on the, the um, hybridization capabilities of these two um, components working together. And like we mentioned early on, right now we're in the very beginning. We have all these different all these different user communities. The electrical engineers, the physicists, the mathematicians, the computer scientists, we're all coming together in conferences like this and we're starting to slowly move together. What we want to create is a new hybrid HPC QC community. For that, we've, oops, for that, we've been given a whole lot of funding for this. I do have to say it is super fun working in both Bavaria and Germany and Europe. Um, I mean, I, I came from a very well-funded Department of Energy, but it's really fun. We're here right now, I have to say. There's a lot of potential to really do something big and to know you have the backing to be able to do it, it is pretty phenomenal. So we have, we're taking our quantum portfolio, quantum computing portfolio, coupling that with our already existing HPC research portfolio, pick, cherry picking from both in order to bring these components together. We've been working with the entire European community um, because again, we've got six centers throughout Europe that are going through the same thing right now as we are but many other systems, are, our centers are looking to do the same thing. Vendors are looking to figure out how to hybridize well. And so we hold these summits. This was the first one. We held another one later. We'll have another one later this year or early next year. But bringing together the community again, sitting everybody down at the table. Lastly, I want to make a small quick advertisement for uh, IEEE Quantum Working Group. This is something that I, for LRZ, uh, TOOM, Ireland Compute Center, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge, we all got together, we went to IEEE and said, hey, can we form a proper working group on quantum HPC, address all these issues from the infrastructure down to the culture, down to the software, all of these components that are hot topics, can we form a group? They said, absolutely. And so we launched that at IEEE Quantum Week uh, in September. The next session is going to be at the Supercomputing Conference, so if you're there, please do come join us. Um, you can catch the uh, QR code or this website to get a little bit more information. So, I've thrown a lot at you, I know. I want to bring it back to the beer garden. So let's take a moment to reflect, okay? Now I talked about beer garden culture, right? I want to end this with a little bit of a twist. And I think you probably heard this maybe as I went throughout. We have these kind of unspoken rules with the beer garden culture. Well, I like to also think Bavaria is this beer garden science culture that I've really seen, and one of the things I really genuinely love about being here. Again, as I mentioned before, the foundation for R&D in Munich and Bavaria is solid. We have the legacy of the people who sat in the beer gardens and the lecture halls before us. We have the support of the government to build up in this high-tech agenda. We have this amazing support. Everyone is welcome to come. We warmly welcome new people to come and sit at this table and have conversations with us. So if you're looking for a job, come talk to us. Your input is encouraged. You're heard. 
We're looking for the brightest minds to contribute to this big, big, overarching goal that's greater than any one of us. And again, just like you can bring your own brezen or your own pretzels or your uh, grandma's uh, cheese dip called obatsta, you know, you're also welcome when you come here to bring your own ideas, to bring your own uh, innovation. It's most warmly welcomed here, and we love to have you. So thank you so much for those who have come, who have traveled to Bavaria uh, to be with us today and to Munich. For those of you that are already here, looking forward to continue working with you, and thank you all very much. I would like to thank my crew, um, our LRZQ crew. Um, all of this stuff that I have presented, I have created almost none of it, with the exception of the, some of the proposals. This is the team uh, on our side that's really crafting a lot of this great work and would be happy to speak with you more. Thank you very much.